happy to be here. It's my first time out to South Dakota, like many of you. It is awesome. So I'm going to be talking about one of my passions, which is memory forensics. A little bit about me, just a little bit. Uh, I teach for SANS. I've been teaching for SANS as a certified instructor for five years. And again, in the digital forensics incident response track. So you might have had me in the 500, 508, 504. But the class that I own is the memory forensics. So that's the 526. And check it out. It's cool. I'm not going to talk too much about it. But I am going to show you how I was able to make my team more effective. My most recent full-time position was uh, leading an incident response team at Cargill. I think it's still up there. But uh, it was a good time, man. It was a good time. And uh, oftentimes, incident response teams, well, you know, there's no time for root cause analysis. So you have to be pretty picky about how you proceed with compromised systems. I don't, anyone working IR right now? Oh! Dude, I'm so psyched to be, I'm, okay, okay. I was pretty happy already, but the fact that about half of you raised your hands, I, I feel like I'm amongst friends, you know? Uh, you should feel that way too. So what we're going to be, uh, well first off, because we are talking about you all, good job, man. Good job in furthering your skill set. It's no joke, you know you have to go to grounds and continue your learning constantly to stay up to date in this field. Uh, some of you may be checking your Twitter feed right now. Am I right? No. There's only a couple of you looking down right now. But yeah, I mean, isn't that how we stay up to date? Just constantly attending training, watching webinars, which are so uh, very, very many of them these days. But I commend you. I commend you. Uh, not everybody's here. Look to your left and right. There's empty seats for shame, for shame. We're going to shame those other folks that didn't make it to this, this conference, this attend presentation. Hey, so as I was growing my incident response team, there was a certain skill set I was looking for. It's true, it's true. Uh, definitely people who had been in the trenches, who had worked investigations of an enterprise scale, uh, maybe who had experienced a little bit of pain and embarrassment, you know, that, that tempers an incident responder, would you say? You know, the more that you've seen, the more hard times that you live through, I, I think that makes you a, a better incident responder, but don't tell your boss that, uh, you know, it's, it's, you have to act the part, like, I can't believe the attacker did this. What? But, uh, you know, as I, I grew the size of my incident response team, we actually doubled the size while I was at Cargill, and uh, I got to do a lot of interviews, and I was always looking for purists. You know what I mean by purists. People who want to do a deep dive, who actually want to find out root cause. Like, okay, this malware is fascinating, but how did it get there? And they want to apply, whether they be network forensic specialists or host-based forensic specialists, they want to apply their unique skill set in order to find the answer. So I hope that you guys will join me in doing just this very same thing with the six systems, maybe plus one, that we're going to be looking at. So first and foremost, I have to kick out and say memory forensics is awesome. Yes. Oh, yes. See? That's what I'm saying. Yeah, he's a, f you're an alumni, right? Are you a GCFA already? Yeah, 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 awesome. Congratulations. 508 alumni here. So uh, I'm not going to go through each and every one of these reasons why you need to be looking in memory, in system memory. I'll just ask, are you? Do you have the ability in your enterprise to reach across the wire and pull back the contents of physical memory? Some people are saying no, yes, there's some hands going up, impressive, impressive. And uh, the last time we asked via SAN survey, it was right at 40%, that was last year, we asked how many of the participants of the endpoint security survey have the ability to pull back memory data? Um, it was just at 40%, so I think I'm, uh, I'm amongst the elite here. Very well, very well. So we're going to find firsthand how the contents of memory is going to behoove us. Kind of like sh shed light on what happened. The first compromised system that I want to introduce to you, um, well, it's an antivirus hit. And you're like, bah, that's crap, I'm out of here. I'll turn around again, so anyone who wants to leave, okay. All right, no, no, no. So again, if you're just walking in, this isn't the AWS presentation. No, it's even better than that. So host base, host base forensics. This first system was identified by my SOC analysts. Yeah, yeah, every morning we had a stand-up meeting. 
uh, incident response team and SOC analysts, and I think that's very important, you know, the communication. We weren't there for every turnover because we had 24-7 follow the Sun Security Operations Center, but we were there every morning like, when it counts, right? And we went over the antivirus report, and largely if the antivirus product that we were using, it wasn't Sophos, come on. Uh, the antivirus product that we were using said it had quarantined something, my analysts weren't concerned about it. Is that the right way to proceed? I mean, well, you might want to find out more details. So in this case, we have a screenshot of Sophos identifying an SVC host. Those are always legitimate, right? I see some people nodding, hell yeah, I love this crowd. So we got an SVC host but that's been identified, but it's via scheduled scan. And I don't know how frequently scheduled scans are in your environment, but we were like at a month mark and we'd call it good. You're like, what? Scheduled scans are weekly. No, no, no. In some environments, I assure you, it's like the month mark. So what happens if this SVC host was detected via scheduled scan on the file system? What could have happened between the time that this binary landed on the box and the time, well, in this case, Sophos detected it? Oh, you don't know? Oh, that's a perfect answer. You don't know. Or, or computer science answer. It depends, right? It depends. Oh, I get it. I get it. I like, I like this audience. Um, so we're going to go about figuring out, did this execute? Isn't that one of the most important things to find out at this point? And I, like I said, my SOC analysts were like, well, it, Alyssa, it's taken care of. Antivirus said it's quarantined. But I'm like, dude, yeah, it's quarantined today, but what happened over the last month? since it landed in the box. So I, I encourage my instant responders to do some root cause analysis, to go back and figure out when that SVC host landed. Hey, can anyone tell me, this is obviously an exemplar memory image and system that I'm, that I'm queuing off of, that I have Sophos running on. Where did I get the VM from based on the user profile? Does anyone recognize the user profile where the SVC host was detected? It says IE user. Is anyone using the free VMs from Microsoft? Thank you, thank you. If you're not downloading the free VMs from Microsoft, I know they put them up there so you can do what, uh, web app te testing. But dude, those are awesome. All of these different versions of Windows and you can infect them. So I don't know, break open your laptop, start downloading now. Anyways, uh, so the next thing that we did, of course, was dump memory because I strongly influenced my team. I'm like, you need to go get memory of this system. So I present to you the output from running PS list, and then, of course, bringing it into Calc, which is OpenOffice's excellent spreadsheet application, and kind of just filtering on SVC hosts. I ask you, which one of these should I be concerned about? Which one? The top one? The middle one? Ah, you guys are saying the last one. Can you give me three reasons why the last one is all kinds of crazy and, and worrisome? You can, you can answer in your head. You're just not like, yeah, I totally, I see three. You can give me two of them. Oh, session two. He's holding up his hand. So session enumeration, yeah, he's saying that last one. I'll just go ahead and point it out. That last SVC host is the one that was hanging out in the user profile directory. And this is a process list. So I'm, I'm actually parsing the memory of the system that we thought was all clear because Sophos quarantined this. I'm seeing that SVC host is currently running despite it being sucked off the file system. Um, and I know that this is not a legit SVC host well, because it's in session two, which is a user session. Where, why else? The parent process identifier. We don't know what the parent process identifiers are of the legitimate SVC host. We know it's 476, which is? Do it, do it. Services, services, yeah, okay. You just, at this point, if you're not down with Windows, I guess that's respectable. You know what I'm saying? It's good to deny that you're a Windows user slash investigator. Uh -huh. But uh, 476, it must be services because that's legitimate. And a Windows system wouldn't run without legitimate SVC hosts, we hope. So having something other than that as the PPID is concerning. We could also point to the start time. This started way after, like days after the other SVC hosts. So I feel pretty good about this. I mean, bad about it. But remember, my team is a bunch of purists. They're like, hell yeah, this machine is compromised. Let's keep on going. Let's keep on going. So what else should we ask at this point in time? Just follow your instinct. 
It's hard. It's hard. I know you want to fire someone, don't you? You want to find out how this got on the box. That's what I want to find out. You were going to say? Ooh, he's actually saying that we do a little bit more investigating and figure out who the process identifier 400 is, and that actually turns out to be Explorer. I don't know whether I give that a uh, little shout out or not. Do I? Nah. Explorer launched this thing. You can see full path of where this current process is running from, app data. There it is, man. So Sopo said it had taken care of this, but we have a copy of that binary up in memory, and it's currently running. Whatever this malware was designed to do, it's been on the box for, well, that's the question, right? How long has it been on the box? Can we find the initial vector of infection? How did it get on the system? So let's do it. Let's do it. So I'm throwing out some volatility plugins. If you're, are you down with the volatility? You guys, incident responders are probably using it on a daily. So good, good. So I'm just like kind of, I don't know, giving a little coding up there, this keyword coding for plugins. So then the next plugin that I ran was MFT Parser. Because I'm a fi I love file system forensics too, so I'm all about the MFT, carbon for those 1,024 bytes, ching, ching, ching. And what we're able to identify is not the SVC host.exe, because that record, I don't know what happened to that record. You know, some records are corrupt in memory. You're not going to get them all, it's okay. But we do have the directory that was created by the dropper, and I thought that was pretty cool. The directory is Google. And so we have time and date stamps that show. <laughs> I'm smiling. We have time and date stamps to show when that was created, and I think that's pretty good. Maybe actionable enough to fire someone. I'm always so excited. I didn't really share with you that my background is uh, an employee investigator for a large government contractor, so I get really excited, like, oh, it's his fault. It's her fault. Okay, I would always say it's the user accounts. I can attribute the activity of the user account, because that's the way you write a forensics report. So it, it's good, though. Join me. All right, so we are going ahead and looking at all of these MFT records. Because there's a couple ways you can run MFT parser. You can actually send it to a body file, and, and then you can run Mac time against it. This is just pure nerdy digital forensic stuff. Folks that were working on the offensive side of the house, I used to work with them. Uh, they called me Indiana Jones. And I thought that was a little dated, honestly. I mean, it kind of showed how old they were, and it felt weird to me, but I get it. Like Artifact Hunter, Indiana Jones? No? That's it. What would you say? Yeah, it's, it's the 80s, it's the 90s. All right, so what do we see here? We see the Google directory, because I know I have that MFG record. That's gonna be the one that's lower. And as you go up the slide, you're going back in time. So it's older MFG records. Uh, so I actually have something that's quite interesting to me. It's the loyalty card.exe that looks like it was from a directory called loyalty card JPEG, and that's weird. Uh, but I get it, right? Because everyone wants a discount. Woo, thank you very much. Jealousy, it's, it's a good feeling to inspire an <laughs> audience here. All right, so I'm thinking I might have identified the dropper that then copied the SVC host. You know what, SVC, it, you don't need privilege escalation to write then to the, uh, that profile directory, do you? Nah, nah, so I'm thinking this is a chain effect, and don't, don't believe my MFT records, because maybe you're a doubter of the file system, because of like time stomping and all. So maybe you switch back and you want to do more evidence of execution. Well, shout out to the FireEye team that developed the Shim Cache Mem plugin in Volatility. It is amazing. You can actually go into your memory image and pull things that have yet to be written to the registry. You know Shim Cache. It's all about application compatibility. And uh, I know that has very little to do with forensics except the fact that it leaves behind artifacts. Okay, it, it depends on which realm you're working in. But join me in looking at Shimcache Mem, which are things that are hanging out in a buffer somewhere in memory that we're pulling out now. This is evidence of execution. Don't get too excited about those time and date stamps that you see there. They're actually the last modified time associated with the MFT record of said evil. But do you see what I'm seeing? I see the SVC host now. The SVC host is up there. And let me blow this up so you can see it too. Fully appreciate what we got going on here. I got SVC host, which is a higher rank. 
So the things that are at the very top of your Shimcash mem are the things that have run most recently. It's beautiful, this, this plugin. Ah, what did Fred do? It's amazing. So the very top is going to be like rank order one most recently run. You come down a little bit further, and now we got a historical walk back of evidence of execution. This is perfect for us. Take a look. Prior to the SVC host.exe running from the Google directory, we have that strange loyalty card.exe. Lame. All right, all right, all right. So we probably have enough to go off of from here. Two things that we could go about extracting if loyalty card.exe is still memory mapped. You know you want a copy of that. You might be able to find it on the file system, so I'm not poo pooing file system forensics. But you know, I have a memory image here in front of me. Let me use it to the fullest extent. So I'd pull these things out. I think I actually pulled out the SVC host and ran strings against it because, well, you know, that's a solid technique too. Static analysis, man. So these are the strings I was able to pull that I found interesting, kind of speaking to a bot, some mutex. Ah. And uh, in summary, I think you guys helped me. I mean, you listen. Next time you'll participate more, right? Do you feel comfortable with how this is going to go? That was system number one. Oh, okay. This, all right. So, thank you. Thank you. The guy who participated actually gets to celebrate with me. It's fine. It's fine. So let's talk about system number two. System number two is a little bit more sophisticated. Now, I can't say that many incident response teams have that opportunity to put on their proactive hunting hats. Come on, man. We're working hard these days, and it's very hard to convince the top level execs that we need to grow our team and expand because they ask for metrics, you know, like, ah, what's your time to remediation? <laughs> How many events are you handling these days? And what are you going to do when you're not handling events and incidents? And I get it. I get it. So sometimes we do have the opportunity to put on our proactive hunting hats. Um, we have tons and tons of content out there that tell us what to look for. But in this case, what did I look for? Oh, I pulled back some prefetch files. So if you, like me, I mean, prefetch is my favorite, favorite evidence of execution. I know it's not for me. It's not for the forensic examiner. It's all about efficiency, right? Prefetch It's supposed to like preload all of the dependencies for an executable into memory and, uh, and track that in a PF file that shows what is the computer going to need to load the next time that kicks off, right? And there's optimizations. But you know, forensic examiners, we get really excited if there's prefetch. Am I right? Am I, oh yeah, I like to joke that, you know, if there's no prefetch, I'll subcontract that work out, you know, it's like, oh, too hard. So this is what I'm doing. I'm pulling back across the enterprise all of the prefetch files and I'm doing some uh, stacking, some data stacking. Now you probably have a method of doing this, right? At the enterprise level, you could be doing it like just via PowerShell. Kanza is a good tool for data stacking, right? Pull back all of your prefetch with Kanza, which is a PowerShell framework. And you're able to sort by, in this case, maybe I've chosen wrong because it's order of frequency by most frequently occurring. Is that notable? Like, is NTOS boot interesting? Uh, no, nah, not normally. NTOS boot, you can certainly set your, never mind. OK, let's switch this around and do least fre frequency of occurrence. And uh, you know, there's a few up here. There's a few of these that like setup.exe, maybe that's okay, but I don't know. The, the things that make these unique are going to be the, the path, the path of the executable. So those paths are going to be different for various reasons, but because this is a hunting technique, I don't need to be right 100% of the time. This is supposed to give me something to look at that could potentially align with attacker behavior. Some crazy randomly named executable that creates a prefetch file. I want to look into it. And I certainly, I wish to you that you have a team that has cycles to do this type of proactive hunting. So this machine was identified using these techniques. We found some crazy prefetch file that was only occurring on that one machine, and we kicked back and we looked at it. All right. And this is what we were able to find. Holy, what? All right, all right, all right. So maybe this is for DS Cori, because we don't see DS Cori running so frequently in our environment. I mean, what is it, DS? What does that stand for? If it's, if it's associated with the attacker, it's got to be directory services, right? Directory services. So this is actually, I uh, know, this is a real world uh, investigation. I worked at Maniac for a certain period of time. So I was fascinated in this one investigation by how many times the attacker ran net. 
And I was like, no way, like 20 times, what? So I crafted this, it's pretty cool. And it actually sh points to the attacker's uh, tool directory. He dropped in program data, which I think is pretty awesome. You can see all of this because we had, what is that uh, pro detail process tracking? You guys know the, the event ID for that? For 4688? Dude, that was in a presentation earlier today. 4688. I remember. I remember something. All right, 4688. So detailed process tracking was how I was able to figure all this out, but it all started from a strange prefetch file. I know you're thinking, I could totally do this better. I would have I had an alert for DS query or DS ask or some strangeness. Run, anything running from the program directory, maybe. I don't know. You, you would have gotten there. I like to convince my students that you would have gotten there, maybe using a different technique, but you would have found said evil. So this guy was clearly interacting with Active Directory, creating accounts, initially trying to figure out group membership, and the story continues from there. This spun up into a full-fledged investigation. There was multiple machines. Uh, uh, it's a good one. Proper scoping. Proper scoping. How did you do? Did you feel good about that one? Were you tracking? Like, I want to do some prefetch stacking. All right, all right, that's cool. Number three is another proactive technique. It's a hunting method where you're looking for services that are terminated, ter services that are stopped, that are really designed to protect your environment. Isn't it unusual to find systems with no antivirus running? So a little shout out to one of my favorite tools, Tanium. It's a good tool. It's a good tool. Anyone? Anyone? No? no? Ah, uncertain about it. It's, you can't control it. Whoa, it's like a race car. You need some, you need some special training on it, man. I, it's, uh, you might wrap it around a telephone pole if you don't, if you don't get behind it right. So I'm saying to you, Tanium's good. Tanium's good. But I'm, do, I'm pulling back here, and I got to give credit where credit is due. This is my forensics team, not my instant response team, that crafted this query. The query was to pull back collection of hosts, every host that had the clients running on it. Like, ask the question, okay, are you running the end start? What is end start? Why does that relate to forensics teams? End start 64.exe. They don't come around here, do they? Forensics people. End, end case, end case. Yeah, yeah. So they were wondering which machines were not running end case, but they also asked a question which machines are not running whatever our antivirus was. Do I do a big reveal? Oh, the SEP client. <sighs> so SEP client, that's solid, man. That's solid. But uh, there were some machines that had that disabled. So are you concerned? Are you concerned that there's some machines in your environment? You can probably think of a few that are not running your antivirus. Am I right? And maybe they, they are the ones that qualified for some exception because they're in the, you know, the manufacturing line and you're afraid of, you know, I'm always op operating a crane when I talk about industrial plant environments. But uh, yeah, maybe, maybe you have some that you would have a good excuse, you'd have an exception and some, some mitigating uh, factors that have come into play, so you don't need antivirus. But you know, this is how we identified one of these machines, is we had extra cycles, I asked my team, go ahead and do some data stacking, pull back and figure out which machines don't have antivirus currently on, and, and we go from there. Do you agree with this? You're gonna go back and do this right now. Who's, who's like dialing in? I'm VPNing into my environment right now and I'm using Tanium. It will not master me, I will master it. I get it, good, good, good. So uh, I dumped memory from this system and uh, you know, I, I probably don't need to convince you now why it's compromised, right? Do you see the profile from this volatility analysis? What, what OS is this system running? Oh, you're like, whoa, Windows. What version of Windows? Yeah, it's 2003, you can see up there in the gray, uh, 2003. It's Service Pack, it's Service Pack 2 though. Oh wait, it's Service Pack 1. All right, all right, um, enough. Calm down, everyone. What do you see? Because I, I initially start with connections. Uh, you know, you gotta adjust your uh, volatility whoosh, ninja skills because it's a different set of plugins, whether you're looking at XP slash 2003, or whether you're looking at Vista and Beyond. So we're gonna go with ConScan to gen up this. Are you concerned? You're like, this is preposterous. Who's feeling like this is a contrived scenario? That there's no way this could possibly be in someone's environment. Why? Look at that. Oh, not Metasploit users either, huh? I see, I see. You got 4444. Four, four, four. This is a lazy pen tester. Come on. Uh, that's the, the callback. That's the L port that's by default in Metasploit. It's true, it's true. So you're looking at this list of connections, which would be equivalent of uh, what you might call the netstat ANO. And uh, I see 
lots of PIDs, so I don't really know the owning processes. But what's concerning to me is those 4444s. I got a lot of SMB. Uh, maybe that's legit. Maybe that's normal. Maybe it's normal to see from uh, India to Pennsylvania straight across 445 in your environment. Flat environments, I mean, they run efficient. But let's continue to research because I am concerned about what those ports, those PIDs are. OK, awesome. Do a little PS scan. Why did I choose PS scan? Well, because it gives me a historical view of what ran in the past. A little bit more than PS list would have, you know. Now it's just carving for those e process blocks. And I have a lot of run DLL 32s, um, CMDs. I used to have a behavioral indicator of compromise that scanned for all CMDs. Um, it was exhausting to go through. But I mean, you should put on your pro hunting or proactive hunting hat, and maybe that would be uh, fruitful. What else is, is curious about this? Netcat. All the way down there at the bottom, if you see nc.exe. Um, and it had a PID of 1308, so let's see if it owns any of the ports. No, it doesn't own any of the ports. But certainly, some of these, some of these connections are owned by rundealo32.exe. So um, I think we, what we just did was increase the scope of our investigation. We just added some more machines that are internal to this environment that are involved in the compromise. We don't know what's going on, but we know it's not just this system, would you say? I mean, who's working for billable hours? You know, did you see what we just did there? We took one system and now we're like, oh, I need, uh, let's go back. I need 10.10.75111. I need a memory dump from, I need a memory dump from, and on and on and on because you're very concerned. What's happening with these systems? Why are they making inbound connections? Potentially, I guess we could figure that one out. Hmm, all right. Maybe a little bit more memory analysis would ensue. You'd want to figure out what, what's going on in the context of these run DLO 32s. One of the questions you might ask yourself is, is there code injection? And of course, we find that Malfind delivers yet again. Malfind identifies in the context of one run DLO 32 a ton of memory ranges that are showing signs of, well, they're marked as execute, no path to disk, and they're not all no bytes, so we have something that we need to look into. I run strings against one of these memory ranges and it comes back with an interpreter, boom! <sighs> All right, done, done. Good job, good job by the way. Do you feel, like, is this satisfying? Satisfying, yes, all right. So system number four, this happens too, but it really depends on the relationship that you have with your users, whether they're going to call and complain. Like, dude, my machine is running slow, just be aware that by the time they call you, they've attempted to clean up, right? Like, oh, it was probably that, uh, that uh, productivity loss website that I was visiting. Hmm. I don't know. I, I probably need to remove some of these uh, programs that I've installed that might have, have back doors. Uh, you know, so just realize that if we're informed by the user that their machine is running slow, it's probably made it through a couple of layers of, of sanitizing. I don't know. Let's see. Let's see. So that's how we were able to find out about this one. We reach across the wire, we pull back a memory dump, and this looks pretty legit. Anyone, anyone want to guess what type of system this is? This is system number four. Dude, oh, oh, is it because the profile is up there? Is that, is that why? I, I was so excited because you can kind of, there's a telltale sign too in the process list that we talk about in class, and I, I like, I swell with pride every time my students are like, whoa, I see that task taskhost.exe is there. That's obviously a Windows 7 machine. I was like, hell yeah. You could get pretty good at this just by looking at a process list and being like, dude, that's the latest Windows 10, 17134, because it has a registry process, boom. Uh, good stuff, good stuff. So, uh, uh, good job. I don't see anything too suspicious. Uh, what tells me that someone's logged in? Do you see a process that might be indicative of someone logging in? This is amazing. You, you see it, huh? Oh, your boy, he's like, it's up there. It's up there. Uh, Explorer.exe. Nice, explore. Yeah, you don't have that telltale sign of like session enumeration that started like at, as a vista. So we're kind of left hanging a little bit on this one, but you know, I don't really see anything in the process list. Let's go ahead and look at network connections. Is there anything strange here? Now, I, I don't pull out your domain tools and start looking up IP addresses and uh, nah, 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 that's not necessary. What, do you recognize any of the PIDs that are over in the right-hand column? I know they all have to be divisible by four. That's just one of the things for Windows. But PID4, what is this? P4, 
PID 4, the system process, should it be communicating outbound on port 80 to some remote host? Like, oh, mine does. I don't know. <laughs> no, no. It would, unless you have a really good reason why your system process is communicating to a remote IP address on port 80, you need to look into that. You need to look into that. This turns out to be a stormworm infection. Um, and if you were to pull any of these IP addresses, it would square you away and be like, ah, there's, there's a problem there. What I decided to do, I know it's a little bit advanced. It's kind of a break the glass technique. My co-author, that's uh, Jake Williams, for the memory forensics class, this is one of his, his terms, break the glass. Like, you would never just jump in and be like, I feel like doing a callback. Unless you were hunting in a modern malware and you knew that you can't hook anymore to the system call table, you need to like be a little bit more creative. So join me in looking at this callbacks plugin output from Volatility. You can see here I have two callbacks that were registered by unknown. And that's probably always bad. It's always bad. Yeah. I, I need to figure out what unknown is because clearly Volatility was unable to map it to something that was uh, in the modules list. So are we good? Are we good? You're like, uh, uh, this isn't supposed to be depressing. We're knocking this stuff out, man. Do you feel like maybe I need to pay you? You know, because you've been looking at so much of my data and you're like, yeah, go, go, Alyssa. That, 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 that one right there. Thank you. Is that enough? Thank you. I'm, I'm going to be turning in my deliverables after this presentation and I'll have all of your names on it. Be like, ah, oh, my work is done here. So uh, numbers, number five. System number five is based on an IOC hit. Now, you might not be a believer in IOCs, much like you weren't a believer in antivirus. Why? Well, indicators of compromise are based on past evil, and my environment is totally unique. And you know, attackers are going to have to try to get into my environment. So every IOC that you've ever seen before is going to be null and void as I'm looking. Maybe, maybe. I know IOCs, they can be brittle at times. But this one's pretty behavioral based. Um, this it pivots off of what we learned from the number one and number two based on prefetch conversations. What you're looking at here is a prefetch file that points to an executable that ran from a user's directory. I think it's roaming. Yeah, just straight up roaming. So that should always be bad unless you have some other explanation. Notice uh, a student has said to me, uh, Alyssa can say in 100 words what could easily be said in 10. And I said, thank you. They wrote that on my eval. We get evals all the time. And I was like, thank you. That means I'm an excellent forensic examiner because you should never say there is no malware. Should you? Should you ever say there is no malware on this system? Nah. You should say, based on the time allowed, using the methods employed, blah, 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 blah. No evidence of blah, 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 blah. Do you agree? No. Thank you. I see you nodding. Yeah, blah, 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 <laughs> OK, so 100 words. Don't, don't use the 10. So I will say that this indicator of compromise uh, allowed us to identify a prefetch file that pointed to an executable and it was running from the roaming directory of a user's profile. And that, I, I actually get a little bit sick in my stomach when I think about that, because that's dirty. That's dirty. You shouldn't be running there. Mm, OK. And I think a little IOC definition for those of you that are not down with that. But uh, MFT parser, why did I decide to go with that first? Ah, uh, because I hit the prefetch file first. And then I parsed the prefetch file, and it pointed to this executable. This is the one that was running from the roaming directory. Are you, are you feeling pretty down with this? When I and I is legit, yeah? I mean, when init, when I net, when I and I, no? I, I, I don't see any nodding, nor do I see any violent disagreement. Like, ah, don't, don't do it, Alyssa. Don't do it. Don't double click on that. No, so what we're seeing here is an MFT record, so a master file table record, straight up. And it's pointing to, or the metadata of this task host.exe. And this is pretty legit, man, because task host is supposed to be running on a Windows 7 machine. So what's another task host? Just like kick it out there, you know? Um, and it would be really hard, I'll admit, really hard for my IR team, as well as my field services and my SOC analysts, to pick this out of the lineup unless they got a process list and they're going to go deep and they're going to get command line. So important for command line stuff, right? So let's see if this is running. Right now, we only have an MFT record that we've drawn out of memory. And uh, yeah, I'm interested. So now we're the same. I mean, timeline analysis, yeah, you'll have to excuse me because it's kind of a forensic examiner thing. Like, oh, I feel like doing timeline. I can't move on until we put it on timeline. 
So that's what I'm doing here. I'm taking all those MFT records and dropping them in. Um, anything happening immediately prior? Well, this is a handle to the key uh, and last modified time of that key. So I'm not really getting any more than I, what I might initially had, but what is this evidence of? It's the same executable, but now what are we seeing? Based on the presence of the executable in the key, Ah, uh, I hear you guys saying it. Nicely done. They're saying persistence. So yeah, a lot of my buddies, they'll start their investigation. I think because they're so fed up with malware today, they're like, I'm just going to look for persistence, like auto runs. Mark Rosinovich would want it this way. And they pull out their auto runs in however context or tool. Maybe it's Kanza, maybe it's Tania, maybe it's just straight up auto runs. Uh, via PowerShell, you can push that. Uh huh. And they'll pull it back, and they'll just look through the common persistence locations in the registry, as we're seeing here. Or they'll just straight up look for services, man, because that's about 70% of malware that instantiates persistence that is going to create or hijack a service. So that's, that's pretty slick. That's pretty slick. So good job. I mean, I definitely write this one up in my report. So that was current version run as you're looking at it. What's happening prior to current? Oh, who's flipping over the table now? This is a contrived scenario. Do you see what's happening up here? Higher in my timeline, my MFT records. This looks like someone uh, infected their own machine because I see, what is that, a SHA-1? SHA-1.exe, SpyNet. You can actually see how this machine was infected because I'm pulling user assist. Actually, this is timeliner output, isn't it? Timeliner, not just MFT parser, but timeliner is being pulled in and shown to us. So this is good stuff because uh, evidence of execution for spynet.exe. And shortly after that, we see that relationship exist between the persistence key and whatever else is currently running. It's good stuff. It's good stuff. You agree? Yeah, I don't know if you feel done with this one yet. But yeah, we'll, we'll go ahead and we'll verify that the user who's currently logged in at the time we dumped memory has the task host.exe hanging right off of their current version run in their end to user dot So that's what we're seeing here. And a little shout out to Thomas Chapatia who wrote this auto runs plugin. It's good. It's good. So I think, I think we're rounding the bed on that one. Woo! Speed round. Speed round. No, it gets a little bit harder from here because I got to. You have to hear from me about this network forensics-based tool, StealthWatch. Is anyone using this? Is anyone using this? StealthWatch? No? What? Come on, man. The ability to use NetFlow information to figure out what is going on in my network. And I know it takes a lot of time to baseline these network intrusion detection uh, products that are in your environment. But I, I would say um, once you get it rolling, you might benefit from something like this, which is a stealth watch high concern index hit. So there's one machine inside our environment that was active. OK, there's a lot of machines inside our environment. One of them was detected with this technique. Um, and it was acting crazy, right? Network, network. So the fact that we identified this one machine based on network traffic means that when I get a memory dump in front of me, and I know you guys are probably thinking, like, how is she dumping this? Like, how is she dumping all of these memory images? I know what you want to ask me what my favorite tool is. Am I right? Like, what's my favorite acquisition tool? It's like I can read your minds. What, it, what do you use? What do you use? Whatever I tell you to, huh? Yeah, win PMAP, F response. That's nice, F response. What else is a possible solution here? I talked about Tanium. Tanium uses the win PMAP, pushes that driver. Is it in case we'll do it, right? In case we'll pull it back, FTK. Nice, FTK imager. I don't know, dump it. Is anybody using dump it? Little shout out to Matthew Swish. Really? That's messed up. That's, you guys, I must have named your favorites. Very early on, I must have named your favorites. OK, we'll proceed. Now that I've made you a believer that you, could, that you too could dump all these memory images, we can proceed. So is anyone nervous? Maybe that's why I lost your attention. Are you nervous about what you're seeing up here? Because the first thing I'm going to do when I get that stealth watch high concern index is like, OK, it was acting crazy on the network. We're going to go ahead and we're going to run net scan. What's concerning about this? Yeah. Yeah, 445. Who should own 445 comms? Uh, mostly. You know, the majority of the time. Who should, who should own as a process 445? Like, it, it depends. OK, OK, get past the it depends. Based on what you've seen, if it's just straight up like net use, little uh, map drive, it's system. So PID4, do you see any PID4s here that own the 445? I see, I see one, and that looks that's probably us. That's probably us connecting to the machine and doing some investigations. Ah, ah. But who else? I mean, what other process owns the 445 comms? 
MSSEC SVC. Does anyone recognize this process name? It's good. You guys, you live a charmed life. Charmed life. All right. Uh, then I'll, I'll save. I'll save the grand finale here. I'll wait. I'll wait for it. But, you know, four for five, can you tell me why did we think this was patient zero in this compromise? As you're looking at this memory dump and you see 445 connections, is there anything that would be concerning to you? It's a whole bunch of outbound traffic, so obviously this machine is attempting to connect to remote IP addresses on 445, which is a little bit obnoxious, a little bit obnoxious, but do you see the inbound 445? The only way we're able to see the inbound 445 connection to this system, let me get my pointer out, oh wait, that's good is because I'm scanning for the presence of these TCP underscore endpoints. I wouldn't see this if I was interrogating the machine across the network using, say, WMIC. I wouldn't see the closed connection because it's already been removed from, say, your net stat output. The only way I'm seeing that closed connection, which is an inbound to this system's 445 from remote IP address, is because I have the memory image and this data structure is there. As you consider it an unallocated space in memory. So it's cool, NetScan allows me to carve this out, and I'm like, damn, you know, this very well could have been patient zero in what type of infection? Anyone? Like, it could have been anything. Any, any nasty eternal blue, yeah, any nasty eternal blue compromise. You'd be right in saying that. So what we're looking at here is what we deem to be patient zero, and uh, we're seeing evidence of initial infection. The bad thing about um, time, I'd say, Network connections, as we're pulling them out, they don't have time and date stamps associated with them as you're retrieving these artifacts from memory. Yeah, you got to get it from a different data source. Yeah, that's all right. That's all right. We'll proceed. Yeah, that one's pretty, uh, pretty interesting, too. I would I immediately expand the scope of my investigation. Uh, it's the whole world. I don't know. Uh, 445. This is probably a highly infectious system. Malware propagation was rampant. Um, it was very aggressive. So, of course, you want to pivot to owning process, getting more details about that particular process that was running that was responsible for all of those outbound queries, you know, attempts to connect uh, to remote IP addresses. So this is what we were able to get. Note that time and date stamp might be relevant here. But I know what you're thinking, dwell time, Alyssa, right? What is average dwell time these days? Do it, average dwell time. It's like a 60, 70, I mean, it, it does depend on who you are and what you're willing to admit to. Um, we ask our SANS participants for the surveys, and they say, oh, two days. Two days, less than two days, less than two hours. We're able to detect a system that's compromised. Ten minutes after that, it's remediated. <laughs> it's okay, it's okay. Serious face, serious face. It's, it's not easy, it's not easy stuff, and it all depends on definition. So we kick back and we run shimcache mem, which I know pleased you before, right? Evidence of execution, where you can kind of put it in order. I have MSSEC, SVC, and then I have that task, SCHE.exe. This is obvious, okay, it's obvious to me because I've been bur burned by it, but I can see all kinds of things popping up in my timeliner output. And then finally, an injected LSAS. That might be like the finishing blow. This LSAS has a memory range that, oh, it has a, a DLL, has the MZ header that's tucked away in an alloc memory range allocation. Uh, it's clearly no path to disk. That's why Malfine is complaining about it. So what, what do you do when you find something like this? Oh, don't let me get in your way. Don't let me get in your way. You know you're going to upload it to virus total. Woo! All right. So we upload that memory range after already identifying and knowing what we're dealing with and knowing that it's uh, not commodity, but it's well known. We would upload this and we get back, hey, this is WannaCry. You can see that AHN Lab does not let us down in proper identification. There you go. Do you, do you use VirusTotal at all? All right. Yeah, for some purpose, to laugh at others, to laugh at the victims of the world. I get it, I get it. All right, so I have five more minutes, and I would like to offer a bonus system. Are you down with that? Or is it just, is it just too much? This would be system number seven. Oh, I, I always, always, you miss your workplace. You want to go back to your shop and look at, you know, images from compromised systems. All right, let's, let's jump in. Now, this one doesn't look too bad. It honestly doesn't. But I was able to figure out that something was wrong with the system because I enumerated processes and looked at the session association. Now, we've done this before, and it panned out for us. If you remember, it was system number one 
where you're like, that SVC host is associated with session two. And session two was the user session. And they log on, and session enumerates, and there you go. So this is what I saw when I was dumping memory on my own system. It looks pretty clean, doesn't it? I mean, I think I actually had notepad running, so it's a little bit different from what I saw. Um, I teach the 526 class all the time, and I was just about to roll into day two. Uh, and I still had some content left from day one, you know, so it's the memory forensics class and I'm like, I'm going to be a good SANS instructor. I'm going to walk through my lab before I get in. And uh, that lab was dumping memory with WinPmem and then bringing it over to my Ubuntu SIFT and doing some analysis. I think we were doing analysis with volatility because recall was in an unstable state at the time. So when I brought it over, um, this is what I saw. You know, going from that desktop to now what I see in the process list, I was a little concerned because my students had the same VM as me. And I was about to roll in and see whether they were seeing what I was seeing. And uh, what's wrong with these Internet Explorers? Volatility doesn't color code people. It doesn't color code for you. But I'm color coding. Those Internet Explorers are associated with session zero. And I know it's been a long time since you've used IE. I get it. I get it. I use it all the time. It's, it's, it's still good. It's still hanging in there. But, uh, you know, what session should Internet Explorer be associated with in most cases? Don't say it depends. Yeah, one or above, right? One or above. It should be associated with a user session. And you know what? If Internet Explorer was running, it should have been rendering windows to the desktop. And I was a little sick. I was, I was a little concerned, of course. And also, because I'm a purist, I was thrilled. I was like, oh my gosh, we have, boom, live malware up in here. Uh, all right. So um, you might want to figure out that guy. I, I, initially, I was like, those aren't real Internet Explorers. You might feel that way, too. Like, those must be hanging off of the C drive or running from somebody's app data local. Uh, but it turned out that these were legitimate, right, or uh, seemingly legitimate. They, they were running from program files, Internet Explorer. So we continue. We continue. Now you might want to do a process list because we haven't done that yet. Um, because before we were kind of looking at sessions, as we go back and we kick it with a process list, there's other things to be suspicious of that are also running quite close in proximity, you know, starting right around the same time as these crazy Internet Explorers. So that's in Spacio. It's, it's throwing out. I don't know what Inspacio is. Let's, let's figure it out. So as I kick back and I run a PS list, how many Inspacios do I see? Recall is a little bit different. Notice that I chose to use a different tool from my tool bag. I, you know, I swapped out. My weapons arsenal is many. And uh, I chose a different tool this time. So Recall actually implements five different methods of process enumeration. It doesn't just walk the doubly linked list of e-process blocks. It brings in a little bit more, a little bit extra. So um, we're able to see some past e-process blocks because of the methods employed. Uh, it's a little bit of PS scan technique there. And um, yeah, two of them are in a terminated state. So I'm like, what is this? This is also quite exciting. Um, you would probably want to find out full path to disk. What else do I do? Oh, faster run. That's nerd stuff because it was a Windows 8 service pack 1, x64. So I ran it again. And finally, timeline analysis. Because you couldn't stop me from doing timeline. Like, when did that Inspacio land on the box? We figure it out. We point the finger back to an installation package. I guess my advice to you is when you're installing Firefox, don't choose the first search results when you type in Firefox download. Don't do that. Don't do that. It's not the SourceForge one that you want to install Firefox. So yeah, what we did was more evidence of execution here. You can see that Inspacio did, in fact, run. I played around with my uh, AMP cache because I couldn't get Inspacio the executable and get a solid MD5 or SHA-1. You can go to your AMP cache registry hive and get it. So I dumped this out with recall my tool of choice now, and uh, went ahead, ran strings against that AMP cache registry hive, and then what did I do? Uploaded to virus total? Do it! Do it! Woo! Uh, I mean, again, it's, it's tragic. It's tragic. It was an absolute infection, a nightmare. But uh, cool, man. Cool. Live infection I dumped memory on, uh, unbeknownst to me, and shocking. So, uh, you know, I, I congratulate you. You made it through all seven systems. And it is now like five zero minutes, 50 minutes. Good job. Good job. I, I want to just thank the 
Wild West Hackfest for having me. It is an honor to talk to you today.